Have you ever built a VHF crystal set? Well, not many people have. But the surprising thing is that with a bit of amplification, AF and optionally RF, you can actually still hear signals on one. Here's an example of one that tunes from 100 to 200 megahertz. It's very simple, just two transistors, one IC and a detector diode. It's certainly not sensitive nor selective, yet you can still hear signals, including, surprisingly, the aircraft band. If you're near an airport, then this is a great project to experiment with. Oh, and you can also hear FM broadcast stations, if they're strong, and even some 2 meter amateur band signals. My first prototype was basically a diode detector, tuned circuit in the front end, and an audio amplifier using the very common LM386. The first problem was what do you do about the variable capacitor? As it turned out, that was a straightforward problem to solve. A commonly available AM radio variable capacitor has two sections, in this case 160 picofarad and the other 60 picofarad. With a fixed capacitor in series with that 60 picofarad section then the capacitance is low enough to tune VHF frequencies. And here's a drawing of the variable capacitor, three connections, the centre is ground which is common to both and the smaller section which I'm using for this is the oscillator and the larger section which I don't connect to anything is for the antenna. So yeah just using a plastic variable capacitor in parallel with this inductor and that resonates over quite a few frequencies in the VHF range. As for the diode detector I'm using a 1N5711. It's a Schottky diode and I'm giving it a bit of DC bias via this 4.7 meg resistor to slightly improve its sensitivity. You don't have to do that. If you've got a germanium diode then you could just use that in this circuit and you can omit the 4.7 meg resistor and the 100 nanofarad there but you might want to put a resistor of say 47k from this point down to the ground. Anyway I've just described there the heart of the receiver which is the diode detector. As for the antenna you just tap that off one or two turns above the earth end. Basically the more sensitive you tap it higher up, but selectivity is poor, and vice versa. So if you're getting a lot of stations that are jumbled together, then just move your antenna and or diode tap a little bit towards the earth end, and performance will improve. But you might lose a bit of loudness. Anyway, that's the detector. You've got an antenna, needs to be a VHF antenna, preferably outdoors something on two meters or for the two meter amateur band would be okay. That's what I use to do the test with mine. Then initially I had this just going into the LM386 audio amplifier module. I haven't drawn a circuit of that here. It's just the common type you can find on the web. You can even buy LM386 modules with all the wiring done. Anyway that worked but signals were very faint so I added a audio preamp this is a BC548, though it could be a 2N3904, 2N222. Basically just an NPN silicon transistor. Provides a bit of audio preamplification and that goes into the LM386 audio amplifier. So this allowed the receiver to drive a speaker. Now, 
you could leave it there if you want to. You could just connect the antenna straight to the tap on this coil. But I had some VHF transistors. Now, any small signal VHF NPN transistor will work here. That operates as a RF preamp, gives you a little bit of a boost, or even if signals aren't very much louder, with this RF preamp, you can tap the coil a bit lower down, and the benefit of that is to give it a bit of extra selectivity. So, yeah, if you've got a VHF transistor, then I'd suggest add the RF preamp. If you don't, then you can still build this project and just connect the antenna uh, one or two turns above the ground of the coil. Now, as for the coil itself, it's round from just you know, tinned copper bare wire. If you've got bell wire, you could strip that. Um, I'd say it's probably about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, maybe 0.8 millimeter diameter. And it's five and a half turns, so you, you do a loop and then um, you can see there's half a turn there, more or less, because it comes off the other side. So yeah, five and a half turns, you can wind it on a drill bit about four millimetres in diameter and stretch it about 15 millimetres long and you can solder various tapping points where you've got the diode and also the input from either the antenna or the RF preamp. Oh, and I drew this diagram here. This is just a block diagram of the receiver, the RF preamp. There's a tuned circuit in here, a diode detector, and two stages of audio amplification. So a very basic straight receiver as used in the 1920s. They're neither that sensitive nor selective, but they will still receive AM signals and maybe even a little bit more as you'll hear later on. Taking a look inside, because 9 volt batteries are fairly expensive, I've put it on the outside of the box so that it's easy to replace. Antenna socket at the top, I've used a BNC. Here's the tuning control. Uh, I used a small speaker, about 4 centimeters in diameter. There's a volume control just near my thumb. It's also got an on-off switch built in, which was handy to save space. And here is a close-up of the front end of the receiver. Right there, near my thumb, is the coil. Um, you might be able to see a blue thing, which is the 1N5711 diode. I've endeavoured to keep leads as short as I can. I haven't always succeeded, but yeah, choose a layout that you keep leads as short as you can. Down here is the RF preamp transistor. It's an old type in a metal can. And then down here, might be a bit hard to see, but the audio preamp transistor. So yeah, two transistors, the diode, the coil, and especially keep connections short between the variable capacitor and the coil. To mount the parts, I've just used a piece of printed circuit board or just blank printed circuit board material. I've given it a good sand with sandpaper, tinned it all with solder so you can more easily solder the components that are earthed straight to the board. And there's a clearer view right there of the diode. Um, you can see the tap, it's tapped on uh, two turns up from the bottom and then tapped up one, one to half turns from the bottom is the input coming from the RF preamp stage. So that's the front end. The remainder of the insides is the LM386 amplifier. Not sure where I got it, it was a pre-assembled module, so I just used that. And it had the potentiometer on the board, but I just desoldered that and attached it to this separate pot which also has the on off switch on the back so that's the volume control now one thing I want to point out is this thing here swinging in the breeze what is it well it's just a terminal lug connected just to the circuit board it's 
basically a earth or counterpoise connection and the reason why that's there is that if you look just near my thumb that's where the corner of the box is where there's screws that hold the metal lid and yet this is an older type of box that has a metal plate and the reason for that is that this is the counterpoise for one half of the antenna so if you're just using a vertical whip you can attach that to the center of the BNC connector you can get connectors that can help make you do that easier and then the counterpoise just goes to this it's not a full quarter wavelength long but it does help a little bit I think and you need all the help you can get with this receiver which isn't the most sensitive let us look at the dial I didn't bother with calibrating anything but if you look closely you'll see there's different colors um, I've got white signifying the FM broadcast band this actually only covers part of the FM broadcast band it goes from 100 up to 108 if you wanted to you could maybe add an extra turn or squeeze the turns together then you'll get down to 88 now the reason why I didn't do that was I wanted enough tuning space at the middle and higher end for the aircraft band and that's where the things marked in red are they are basically spots on the dial where I've heard signals so if you put the dial pointer to that then there's a reasonable chance you'll hear aircraft band signals so these are around this one is 118 this one's 123 this one's 132 and up here is 148 megahertz here in Australia at 148 megahertz we have pager transmitters and they are quite strong so um, if you tune just below there there's the amateur 2 meter band and if you go right up to the top you can just hear hum from digital TV uh, I didn't bother putting a marker there but I do have on the back of the case just a list of frequencies that correspond with there and I've just got different colors white is FM broadcast band red is air band and the blue there is for the 2 meter amateur band if you're in the United States I don't know if they still have them but I think there are weather transmissions up at around 100 and 50 160 I think 162 megahertz um, these are narrow FM signals but I'll do a demonstration later on you may be able to hear those if there's one near you you might have just heard up there it's just at the top end I think that's probably hash from digital TV Just tuning down and that I think is pages pager transmitters just above 148 megahertz so they're quite strong and just tuning across it's not a lot around here uh, weak signals so there you are heard something there that's the aircraft band we'll just keep tuning lower and here we are in the FM broadcast band Now, signals are jumbled together. If you want to separate them further, then you just tap both the diode and the connection from the antenna towards the earth end of the tuning coil. The tuning coil you can see here is, I think, about five or six turns, four millimeters in diameter. Christmas by Irving Berlin coming your way and the music of Cecilia 
like five minutes and a parachute drop. From front of the was overhead point all minutes, point all minutes, Melbourne Coast, still reach traffic, break, break, no, it's in our hotel, it's like five minutes. The thing about crystal sets is they can be made more sensitive if you inject a local signal. That can improve reception of AM signals, FM signals and even allow CW and SSB reception. We'll do a test with a Morse beacon later on. I'll have a beam antenna connected instead of this vertical. But for now, I'll just turn on this nano VNA. This operates as a local oscillator. And on here, I've just got a little loop between the terminals and that operates as a coupling coil. Anyway, let's uh, set it to a frequency that we know there's activity on. In this case, one four five dot six five now we'll just bring this coil with the RF coming out of the nano VNA. Oh, by the way, I've got this set up in setting with stimulus, then it was CW, so I'm just applying a carrier. I've just got the coupling coil fairly close to the coil. Um, turn it around so they're parallel, then there'll be more coupling. But for now, we'll just see if we can find the local signal from the nano VNA there on this receiver. And the receiver will go quiet when you find it. There it is. And that is our CW beacon. Well, it's actually a tone modulated FM. Just to give you an idea of the selectivity, which is not very narrow at all, this is where I'm peaking at 145, 650, and then it's not much of a turn, only a fraction of a turn, and I'm up above 148. So it only just differentiates between those two frequencies, uh, more than two megahertz apart. Just move the oscillator away, weaken its injection, and the desired signal gets very quiet. You can just hear it because the nano VNA is about 30 centimeters away. I'll just turn it off. That's another interesting thing, when I move the nano VNA nearer with stronger injection, that lessens interference from the other transmission up above 148. Okay, I'll just turn the nano VNA off. And the signal's gone, you can't hear it. 
Now I've set the Nano V&A to 147, 175, the output of a local repeater on two meters. It's a bit hard to tell because the pager was going, but someone had actually triggered the repeater and I was hearing it. One thirty two megahertz exactly is a frequency used by planes using Melbourne Airport. So I will put one thirty two megahertz in this nano VNA. So we've got a local signal on one thirty two. We'll just bring that up near the coil. There's the coil there, there's the coupling loop, and we'll just tune for maximum signal. Now, not sure why there's that high pitched tone, it should just be a dead carrier. But there you are, you heard some speech just then. What you just heard then was a strong signal that was audible. Without the nano VNA, but weaker signals need the nano VNA. Now they're not particularly clear, but if I was to be able to easily move the frequency of the nano VNA, maybe 100 hertz off, then that will tune it in properly, like you're tuning in an SSB signal. It's a bit hard to see all the parts, but the transistor for the RF amplifier is down below. You can't just use any bipolar transistor for this application. It needs to be one good for VHF. Next, we'll connect this to a beam and see if we can hear a beacon on 144 megahertz. We need the beam because the beam's horizontally polarised, as is the beacon. All the other signals have been vertical or mixed.
if you look at the orange wire that's what I've got to form a coupling loop it's probably a bit long but if I put it near the end of the coil then you can hear the carrier from the beacon it's not the high pitch carrier but it's the lower frequency one and here it's about 10 millimeters or so from the end Speaking of Roger, a great name for a dog, Rose and Fam texted through asking for some puppy suggestions. .com Boxing Day sale is now on and prices are down for the count. Get up to 70% off a Blockbuster Boxing Day sale range. Hurry, sale ends Saturday. T's and C's at Kogan.com. Don't miss the big whole cinema sale at Big Picture People, Big Screens, Big Sound. <laughs> One thing that's worth noting with this receiver, especially if you're receiving FM broadcast stations, is the importance of antenna orientation. Because selectivity isn't very good, you can partly overcome it by repositioning the antenna so that the undesired signal might fade out and the desired signal fade in. Now I'll try some reception with the antenna in the canopy of a tree and me underneath it with the receiver. I don't know if you heard that but that was quite strong. I'll try again with the camera a bit closer. This has been a fun project. Nowhere near as sensitive as a commercially made receiver, but you can go near an airport with it and it won't cause any problems because unlike other very simple receivers which are super regenerative, this one is a completely passive receiver so it doesn't radiate any RF signal at all on any frequency. If you build one of these, then let me know how you go in the comments. You might be quite surprised at what you can hear, despite its poor sensitivity and selectivity.